Good afternoon, OTC family. My name is Daniel Ogunyemi. I serve as the inaugural Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here, and I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here. This is going to be a phenomenal ride for all of us, I hope. And we're just looking forward to laying a solid foundation for the work that's going to be ahead. In this presentation, I'm going to be able to talk about what diversity, equity, and inclusion is, why it matters, and what we're going to begin doing to implement those factors here at Ozarks Technical Community College. I'm not going to dive too much into the details of data and all these things just yet. Don't worry, stick around for the fall or wherever else after. I don't plan on going anywhere anytime soon. But what I hope to do is tell you a little bit philosophically about what DEI means. Hey, by the way, there's another acronym, DEI. So as you can see, DEI is Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So add that to the acronym bank. Anyway, so the plan is to philosophically tell you kind of my outlook, my lens, what I'm bringing to the table as far as DEI goes, and how we'll move forward as an institution in the coming months, years, and whatever's to come. I'll tell you now, as we go through this presentation, keep in mind that the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion is so that every employee, every student, and the community understands that OTC is going to be a place where people can come and learn, grow, and thrive, however they define that level of success. And so as we develop this office, as, as we develop our plans, our programs, our initiatives, keep in mind that this is what we are aiming to do. The good news is that means you too. You get to be a part of this journey and what I'm going to do, what Dr. Higdon's going to do, what the rest of the OTC family is going to do is ensure that you are able to be a part of the journey with us and that you are going to be resourced however you need to be resourced. And so let's dive right in. So diversity, equity, and inclusion. First, I'll start with this quote. If you've gotten an email from me or any email you'll get, at least in the very near future, you'll see this quote on my signature. This is from Amanda Gorman. She performed this spoken word, The Hill We Climbed, during the presidential inauguration on Jan in January of this year. And in two separate places, these weren't necessarily back-to-back -back lines of the poem, but she said this, we lay down our arms so we can reach out arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. There is always a light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. And so the reason that this poem speaks to me and the reason that I am mentioning it now is because my hope is that we become that light. We become that light for our students, we become that light for our coworkers, and we become that light for our communities. It's no secret that this light is very dim in our nation, is very dim in this area. And so hopefully, as the community college, as people that are passionate about others, we're going to take this initiative to be that light. And so pretty much every time I do any type of presentation, I show this video. This video is uh, by Clint Smith. It was one of his first TED Talks. And he also does spoken word. I'm kind of a sucker for spoken word. But he also does spoken word, and he talks about the danger of silence. And so please take a moment to view this video, The Danger of Silence, by Clinton Smith. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., in a 1968 speech where he reflects upon the civil rights movement, states, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. As a teacher, I've internalized this message. Every day all around us, we see the consequences of silence manifest themselves in the form of discrimination, violence, genocide, and war. In the classroom, I challenge my students to explore the silences in their own lives through poetry. We work together to fill those spaces, to recognize them, to name them, to understand that they don't have to be sources of shame. In an effort to create a culture within my classroom where students feel safe sharing the intimacies of their own silences, I have four core principles posted on the board that sits in the front of my class, which every student signs at the beginning of the year. Read critically, write consciously, speak clearly, tell your truth. I find myself thinking a lot about that last point, tell your truth. 
And I realized that if I was going to ask my students to speak up, I was going to have to tell my truth and be honest with them about the times where I failed to do so. So I tell them that growing up as a kid in a Catholic family in New Orleans during Lent, I was always taught that the most meaningful thing one could do was to give something up, sacrifice something you typically indulge in to prove to God you understand his sanctity. I've given up soda, McDonald's, French fries, French kisses, and everything in between. But one year, I gave up speaking. Figured the most valuable thing I could sacrifice was my own voice, but it was like I hadn't realized that I had given that up a long time ago. I spent so much of my life telling people the things they wanted to hear instead of the things they needed to, told myself I wasn't meant to be anyone's conscience because I still had to figure out being my own, so sometimes I just wouldn't say anything. Appeasing ignorance with my silence, unaware that validation doesn't need words to endorse its existence. When Christian was beat up for being gay, I put my hands in my pocket and walked with my head down as if I didn't even notice. Couldn't use my locker for weeks because the bolt on the lock reminded me of the one I had put on my lips when the homeless man on the corner looked at me with eyes up, merely searching for an affirmation that he was worth seeing. I was more concerned with touching the screen of my apple than actually feeding him one. When the woman at the fundraising gala said, I'm so proud of you, it must be so hard teaching those poor, unintelligent kids. I bit my lip because apparently we needed her money more than my students needed their dignity. We spend so much time listening to the things people are saying that we rarely pay attention to the things they don't. Silence is the residue of fear. It is feeling your flaws gut-wrenched guillotine your tongue. It is the air retreating from your chest because it doesn't feel safe in your lungs. Silence is Rwandan genocide. Silence is Katrina. It is what you hear when there aren't enough body bags left. It is the sound after the noose is already tied. It is charring. It is chains. It is privilege. It is pain. There is no time to pick your battles when your battles have already picked you. I will not let silence wrap itself around my indecision. I will tell Christian that he is a lion, a sanctuary of bravery and brilliance. I will ask that homeless man, what his name is and how his day was because sometimes all people want to be is human. I will tell that woman that my students can talk about transcendentalism like their last name was Thoreau. And just because you watch one episode of The Wire doesn't mean you know anything about my kids. So this year, instead of giving something up, I will live every day as if there were a microphone tucked under my tongue, a stage on the underside of my inhibition. Because who has to have a soapbox? when all you've ever needed is your voice. Thank you. So one of the things that always sticks out to me about silence is how oftentimes we, when we look for someone to speak up for us, when we look for someone to have our back, um, oftentimes we may notice. We notice the positive outpouring. Personally, I've had some recent events in my own life where I've had a lot of positive feedback, a lot of support in something that happened. But the other part of that is oftentimes we notice when people are silent. Um, sometimes we want people to speak up on our behalf, people that we expect to, people that we're longing to speak up for us, and they don't. And so one of the things that we have to ask ourselves is who in our circles, who at this college doesn't have someone that's speaking up for them? Who feels like that we are being a little too silent on behalf of all the individuals that will be and are being served by Ozarks Technical Community College? So with that, I'll start talking about a few diversity, equity, and inclusion principles. Let's start defining what this means. So in this diagram, which I absolutely love, 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 I found it not too terribly long ago. I have the reference down at the bottom. But here it is. It talks about a formula, D plus E plus I. And because we talked about acronyms earlier, you know it exactly what that means. And it's in the diagram. And then equals B. So diversity, equity, and inclusion equals belonging. Now, I want to give you some time to look at this slide. You're going to study it, to look at the, the diagram, and, and develop your own thoughts about it. But in essence, what it says is alone, diversity, equity, and inclusion principles, if they stand alone, they're not very useful. What do you mean by that? And so diversity is the data part, right? So we look at who we have, what we have, what currently exists. Well, that's great. But then if we don't consider equity, which is how are we 
creating access, how are we increasing our borders, how are we increasing the opportunities for people to come in as a student, as an employee, whatever it may be, we might not be able to make it to that diversity, right? So that's diversity and equity side, but then what about the inclusion? And so let's say we have just diversity and equity. And so maybe we do open up our, our borders. Maybe we are able to help people in the community. Maybe it's another company that you're thinking about, right? So when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, or just diversity and equity, what happens is maybe you hire a bunch of individuals, right? Maybe you hire individuals of color. Maybe you hire individuals that have neurodiversity. Maybe you're hiring a lot of different individuals. But here's, the, here's what happens when you're missing inclusion. When you're missing inclusion, those individuals are, are just there. So there are not real ways to engage them. They don't see people that look like them. They don't feel like they belong there. And they're not going to have an opportunity to come and be their best selves while they're at work. Well, let's look at diversity and inclusion without equity. And so perhaps I do have a lot of diversity, right? Maybe I do try my best to create an inclusive environment where people can uh, play the type of music that they want to play, they eat the foods they want to eat, whatever it is to make them feel included. But here's where the equity part is lacking. Where are those individuals, right? Are those individuals allotted the opportunity to advance in their careers, to be in the C-suite, to be executive leaders, to be senior leaders? or is it just an inclusive environment on the front lines? And we have a little bit more to say about that later. And so the, the goal is to create diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? In order for everybody to feel like they belong here at Ozarks Technical Community College. So I'll circle back around to that point later, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about diversity. I'm originally from Ruston, Louisiana. And I grew up around an HBCU, which stands for Historically Black College University. My father is a professor there. All five of my siblings graduated from Grambling State University. I'm the youngest of six, by the way, so shout out to all my youngest out there. You guys are the best. I grew up the youngest of six. All five of my siblings graduated from Grambling State University, and I did not. The reason being, I was a lot of the scholarship to play basketball at Southwest Baptist University before attending Evangel. And that was a culture shock, my friends. So diversity, equity, and inclusion really wasn't even on my radar. Where I grew up, I saw a lot of people that looked like me in many different fields, many different positions, many different areas. And then I move up here, and it was not the case. Now, I'm not saying this is bad, right? I'm not saying this is something that is just so terrible that I wanted to leave, right? That's not the case. But it made me start to wonder. And as I started to get more involved in this community in southwest Missouri, I recognize the term always came up, diversity. We want to increase diversity. We want to promote diversity. We want diversity, diversity, diversity. And what I thought about as I started diving into this concept, as I started learning more, I think we misuse this term diversity. So to you, perhaps I just want you to think for a couple of seconds, when I said diversity, what did you think about? It's likely that you came up with two, maybe three dimensions of diversity. I'm sure you thought about race. I'm sure you thought about gender. I'm sure you thought about sexual orientation. And maybe a combination of any of those three. But diversity is so much more than that. And so all of these things that are listed here equals diversity. And the cool part about it is this is not an exhaustive list. There's so, so, so many things that are on this list that contribute to diversity and the characteristics that make us us that we don't even talk about, we don't even think about at times. So think about uh, geographic or the regions that in which we represent at the college. Think about the veteran status, the veterans, excuse me, that we represent here at the college. Think about just as involved in second chance individuals in which we are trying to continue to grow in investing in as a college. So just think about all these things that we often lack or that we often forget about when we talk about diversity. This is a, um, another diagram that I found that I thoroughly enjoy. And so what this talks about is how our personalities develop, obviously, from our inner being, right? Starts with who we are as a person, our biology, typically things that we don't necessarily have the power to change. So like age, right? So uh, sex assigned at birth. Uh, some of the things that we really don't have the power to change starts to form our personality. 
And then we go to some more external dimensions where we have a little bit more autonomy in how we choose what we decide to align ourselves with. And then we go to the organizational dimensions at a place like the college. Think about that. So where are you in relation to the hierarchy structure or the department that you're in at the college? So as we can continue to build off this dimension of diversity, right, we, we continue to talk about this concept of diversity. Now I want you to think about where equity starts to come in. So we're getting there, don't worry. But think about this. So how often do time, are times where you might see um, someone having a, a barrier surrounding how they develop their own identity? And so each one of these dimensions at times, it could be internal struggle, struggles, it could be community struggles, it could be struggles that maybe as a college we're not, just, we're not yet addressing. And so what's happening when you have these border dimensions of individuals, how are we expecting people to show up as their best selves? How are we expecting people to achieve their highest level of success? And so as a college, we want to broaden our horizons of what diversity is, and we also want to understand who makes people themselves, right? How people become themselves, what characteristics they display. Here's another thing I've heard, but we're in southwest Missouri. The diversity just is not here, right? So I'll pause that statement for a second, and I'll talk about a concept. This is by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. She talks about intersectionality. And this intersectionality, what she says, is that the characteristics that we just talked about on the last screen and many more, those aren't singular, right? So there are many aspects of our personalities, of our, our personhoods, that are intersected by multiple dimensions. And so she also has a TED Talk. I'm a sucker for TED Talks. She also has a TED Talk and many other resources in which she talks about this concept. And so she talks about her concept, uh, this concept as a black female, right? And so she often uh, would go to some rallies that were about like civil rights. And what she noticed is there was a lot of movement being made, but it was movement more so for black males. And then she shifted over and said, well, what about feminism, right? This is surely something that I can also get behind. And what she noticed is that white females were the ones that were beginning to um, be more impacted by feminism. And so she coined this term intersectionality out of a desperate personal struggle that she was identifying with. But then stop and think about it, right? Our unique experiences are oftentimes attributed to the intersection of our personalities. So think about your own personhood. Think about what makes you you. Think about all those character dimensions that make you who you are. That could be military service. It could be, you are a it could be that you're gay. It could be that you are a person of color. It could be where you are from. And all these things aren't separate, right? And so I can't separate aspects of my identity from who I am currently. At least I shouldn't be able to. But think about how many students, how many employees at the college might have to do that. And so as we continue to talk about these concepts, we're going to talk about how we're going to be developing our diversity on campus. This funnel uh, goes back to what I mentioned earlier about I've heard some companies talk about, I'm not talking about OTC right now, by the way, but I've heard some companies say that, oh yeah, we're a diverse company, we have whatever their data is, or whatever their demographics are. And then you say, all right, cool, let me go look at their website. And you're like, wow, aside from this stock photo on the diversity, equity, and inclusion website, I don't see it. I can't necessarily see where the diversity is. All diversity isn't visible, but sometimes it needs to be visible, if you know what I'm saying. People need to be able to show who they are. And so then I start to wonder, well, where is this diversity you're speaking of? I'm not calling you a liar, but I'm just wondering. Where is this diversity you speak of? And what you notice is there's typically this funnel of diversity where most of the employees, well, in this instance, there are a lot of the employees on the front lines that are more diverse than the employees at the top. And so we have to figure out how are we going to continue to address that. Um, as some people say, I'm dating myself. I actually love SpongeBob. And I did grow up watching Spongebob. Spongebob was a jellyfish fisher, which BT up. If you didn't know that that was a real thing, it is. I didn't either until I <laughs> Googled this image. And people do jellyfish fish. Anyway, I digress. The point of me putting this here is although we are in southwest Missouri, we have to figure out how we can cast a wider net in order to attract more people to this area. 
Now, recruiting to Ozarks Technical Community College is going to be one thing. We have great benefits. I think the pay is pretty good, if you ask me. I think there are a lot of things that are good about OTC. In fact, many of you that I've talked to love being here, and you've been here forever. I love it. I dig it. It was one of the things that really attracted me here. But we're not only attracting people to Ozarks Technical Community College, we're also attracting people to Southwest Missouri. We're attracting people to the various areas in which we reside, in which we work. And so how are we also going to be a part of the community to make sure our communities are helping to move forward in our efforts to increase our diversity? So now I'm going to talk about the concept of inclusion. Okay, so we've talked about diversity, and now let's talk a little bit more about inclusion. I and many others are understanding that work-life balance is becoming a little less realistic and work-life integration is more so where we're at, right? What do I mean by that? So we all have stresses, we all have life, right? Life happens. And what we are starting to understand is that it's more or less of a reality, generationally speaking, in today's age, that we are gonna be able to separate what goes on at home from what goes on at work, and also what goes on in the communities around us, okay? So what am I talking about? So I think we all can probably agree that if nothing else, 2020, COVID-19 impacted us, right? And impacted how we view things, view people, it impacted how we conduct ourselves, and impacted some of the traditions and practices that we have. It impacted us, right? And so words like pivot, there's your favorite word for, from last year. Words like pivot and the health disparities and vaccine, do we vax, do we not vax, physical distancing and stay at home, loss, virtual, like all these things impacted us, okay? So show of hands, I wish I could see you, but show of hands, who wasn't impacted by this and how did this not impact your work life? I'm just wondering. The social unrest that happened, right? So we had police brutality, we had Black Lives Matter movement, all the other things, right, back to blue, Karen, that term, Asian hate, that we're still dealing with today. Do you really think that doesn't impact others? The, the political divide, um, by the way, I can tell you firsthand, this, uh, this is real. <laughs> but the political divide, all the things that are happening, right? So the January 6th insurrection, the left versus right, masking, cancel culture, like there's just so much stuff going on that continues to impact us every day. And so I'm of the impression that there's many of these things that I've just talked about, it impacts us beyond diversity, right? It impacts us as humans, okay? And so how do we get to seeing the human in people and allowing people to show up as their best selves? You'll probably hear me say that a lot because I truly believe that if we're not creating a, cl a culture of inclusion where people can show up as themselves, as their best selves, whatever self they want to present, then we have a lot of work to continue to do. We as in OTC, we as in the communities that we serve, we as in this nation still have a lot of work to do where people can come and be their, their best selves. We're gonna to continue to cultivate this through ongoing personal and professional development. My challenge to you as a person is to check your surroundings, see who you are uh, uh, hanging out with, who you're eating with, who you're grabbing coffee with, what you're reading, where you're grabbing your news, all these things, and just continue to challenge yourself as a person. Um, we don't always gonna agree with everybody that we come across, but how are we at least being being open and objective to other perspectives. And then the professional development. So we're gonna to continue to, to work with our office here in trainings, right? And then making sure that we are investing in our uh, faculty and staff and how that we create this culture of in inclusion in our classrooms, uh, in, our, in our everywhere that we kind of step foot. How do we help create this culture of inclusion? Code switching and covering is something that I, I kind of alluded to earlier, how when I was talking about people showing up as their best selves, there are times where people feel like they cannot, right? If they do, they may fear being fired, they may be uh, ostracized, whatever it may be. And so if I show up in my fullest identity, am I going to still be welcomed? Am I going to still feel like I belong? Or will I be ostracized? And so sometimes this leads to people code switching or covering themselves to ensure that they can still fit in uh, with the culture that is currently in the workplace. And then commitment equals budget. So if you did not see this video right here, um, 
it's funny, but he talks about where the money reside, where the money reside. I love that video. It's, it's hilarious to me. But the point in, in putting this up there is the commitment equals the budget. And so OTC, I can tell you, is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Why do I say that? For one, I'm standing here and I'm talking to you about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're going to continue to work on how we can grow this office, not for the sake of growing the office, but for the sake of making sure that we're resourcing all of our students and all of our employees the best way we can. And then, of course, the last concept is equity. So I've listened up there. Oftentimes what happens when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion is we focus on diversity, right? And I'll tell you the philosophy of this office, at least to start, right, is we're going to focus on equity and inclusion. And what that has to mean is that we are listening. We're lending an ear to really any and everybody. Um, I personally don't care if you come and tell me, hey, I think this job shouldn't exist, you need to go, um, all the way to I'm so glad you're here, please stay forever. I want to hear it all. We want to hear it all because the purpose is we want to know the perspectives that are out there and we want to know, again, how we can work with every employee and every student that is here. And so for me, that's primary, listening. That's going to happen from now to forever. And then I would encourage you to do the same thing. Listen. Listen to stories. Listen to data, even when it's hard to listen to. I've understood, I've been here only a couple of months, and I've understood that this is not a culture of this is how we've always done it. And again, I love that. Because when you talk about this is how we've always done it, how we've always done it may not be the most equitable practice. And so how we've always done it needs to be explored. And so if there's a question about something and we can't give backing for it, then maybe that's not a good thing that we're doing. The cool thing about that too is we don't have to be rigid, right? We have a process, a process where we continually review policies and procedures and all the things that we come up with. And as we continue to review those, they can change. As times change, as things change, they can change. And so we're not going to be rigid in just everything that we do because we know that people, things continue to develop, theories continue to come, data continues to show itself. And so as we look at the practices of the college, it's not going to be a this is how we've always done it culture per Dr. Higdon. And so that works out well for the equity part because we're going to be able to continue to talk about the systems in which we operate. I've, got, I've talked about consulting the data and having an introspection, so we're going to take a hard look at things. Um, I'm not coming in to say, hey, we do this terribly, this is bad, this is bad. No, that's, that's not effective, that's not helpful. Um, but we will have to have some conversations that say, here's where we're at and here's where we want to go. How do we get there? Those aren't always easy conversations to have, but those are things that we're going to do and it's going to be a data-driven data office. We're going to talk about our communities. Are our communities in a position to where they can create the most equitable cultures and the equi equitable um, systems that they can? We'll look at local, state, national, and global trends. Uh, back to that work-life integration, things that happen nationally, things that happen globally, uh, funding, all the things that could impact us do impact us. And so we're going to look at those and how those would enable or, or not necessarily allow for equitable practices here on the college campus. And so this is going to look at things like gener generational wealth and poverty, how the school systems, employment, healthcare, urban versus rural areas, like how we resource all of these areas in particular, plus many, many more. So we're going to look at these things, we're going to follow them, and we're going to figure out what the best practice is for us here at the college. Here's another video. So you may have heard equality, right? Equality was a big push, especially early on, whenever you know, the Office of Diversity, or the profession of diversity, equity, and inclusion first came about. So the way, that, the way it came about was pretty much in the civil rights era, but as we started moving towards things like affirmative action, as, you, as you've heard, probably a lot of other terms, equality, justice, right? These are the beginnings of diversity, equity, and inclusion as a profession. What we've found, though, what we've realized is that there's a difference between equality and equity. And I think this video will do a really good job of showing that difference. Today, we are talking about equity and equality. But you might be wondering, wait, aren't these the same thing? They look the same, 
They sound similar, so aren't they the same? No, in fact, they're really different concepts, even though a lot of us get the two confused. So let's break them down. You probably already know what we mean when we say equality. We're talking about two things that are the same or have a similar value. When we treat two people or two groups of people equally, we make sure that they have or get the same things. For example, if I wanna give Betty some apples, then I need to give Ben the same number of apples to treat them with equality. Along the same lines, if I wanna give the nursing program a budget increase, then I need to make sure that I give the culinary arts program the same budget increase to treat them with equality. That makes sense. But that's not the same thing as equity. Equity can be defined as giving everyone what they need to be successful. In other words, it's not giving everyone the exact same thing. And here's where the difference between equity and equality really come in. Because it's important to remember that if we give everyone the exact same thing, expecting that we'll make people equal, it assumes that everyone started out in the same place. So here's an example. In this instance, we give everyone the exact same box, we treat them with equality, so that they can see over the fence. Well, that's great for the person on the left because they were already taller, but it's not so great for the person on the right who still can't see over the fence. From an equity perspective, we wouldn't want everyone to have the same size box because everyone isn't the same height to start out with. With an equity mindset, we would get everyone what they need to raise them up to the same level. Here's another example. With equality in mind, we can treat everyone the same and give them all the same bike, but that doesn't really help the person on the left who can't ride that kind of bike or the person in the middle that is too small for that bike. So when we think about this situation with equity in mind, Equity tells us that we need to give everybody a different kind of bike so they can all enjoy a bike ride. As you might guess, this is where the concept of fairness gets tricky for some folks. We often think that being fair means that everybody gets the same thing, and that's what we were taught when we were growing up. But fairness really only works when we're all the same to start out with. So this is a new idea for many of us to think about. There is this great American saying that people just need to work hard enough and pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. It's this idea that everyone can be successful if you just work hard enough. Well, that's a lot easier to do when some of us were born with longer arms to pull up those bootstraps, or maybe we were given longer bootstraps when we bought our boots. So let's think about moving away from the bootstrap idea and instead think about shoes. There is a quote by Nahid Dasani that goes, equality is giving everyone a shoe, but equity is giving everyone a shoe that fits. So I do want to give you just a few seconds, right? I want to give you a few seconds to kind of write down uh, a takeaway. Right? Write down something that you learned that you never thought about, that stuck out to you, that you didn't like about it. Just take a few seconds down to jot that down. A few seconds to jot it down. If it's something you feel like sharing with me, I invite it. I would enjoy it. I will read them. I will respond if necessary. Um, but I'm, I'm just interested in hearing some feedback about this video, about this concept, about why we're going to be promoting equity over equality. Now, will there be times where equality is, is necessary and okay? Sure, absolutely. But for the most part, we're gonna promote a culture of equity in which we're looking at things for, do you have the right shoe that fits you? One more thing as it relates to this. A friend in this area works with individuals that, are food, that have food insecurity, that um, do not have a home to reside in, and um, she was talking about the stigma that's typically associated with these individuals. And there's a quote that she said that has stuck with me since I first heard it. She said, oftentimes people will look at individuals that are panhandling or on the street or whatever it may be, and they might say, 
well, why won't they just, I wish people would just pull themselves up by their bootstraps. You know, I did it. I look where I'm at. I made it out. You know, all these other stories. And her comment was, well, it's hard for someone to pull themselves up by their bootstraps if they don't even have any boots. And so think about how in some areas we have students that don't have boots. Obviously, I'm not talking about literally not having boots, but what areas have you seen where our students may not be having the boots? And what are we doing to put these types of policies and practices in place to ensure that our students have shoes that fit them? So I want to make a distinction between something, as I just mentioned, diversity, equity, and inclusion kind of started in the legal realm. So I don't, I'm not going to harp on that, but I am going to talk about who I deem my cousins here, right? So don't feel bad if you're not my cousin. We're still family. But my cousins would include like human resources, those are my cousins, disability support services, cousin, Title IX, those are my cousins, right? Now, why do I say that? Oh, let me not forget, I got you, Rachel. Project Hill, Green Dot, like these are my cousins. Why? Because there are certain stipulations and there are certain practices that these individuals, these departments abide by that are closely assigned to my office. Now, let me stop you there. Some of you are like, wait, he didn't mention me. What's that about? Um, probably I forgot, so <laughs> don't feel bad. But here's the deal. I, this office is not coming to rewrite what anybody else does. But what the hope is to add complementary actions to include diversity, equity, and inclusion as we are moving forward as an institution to serve all of our students, to serve all of our employees, to resource our communities in this area. And so what you can expect is increasing knowledge and understanding. Um, that's also to say that I have things to learn. I'm not, I am the subject matter expert. This is my profession. And I'm going to continue to make that commitment towards learning. And so I'm going to help reciprocate that same feeling to my coworkers here um, and the students. Looking at the equitable practices, policies, and procedures, as we've mentioned. Creating inclusive, an inclusive environment and inclusive excellence and an investment in the time, talent, and treasure of the, all the employees that we have here. And hopefully the result is we have graduation and completion rates and certification rates for individuals that have not been. People feel like they belong here. And there are more opportunities and more employment for individuals of all different backgrounds. And so what you can expect, again, is professional development but we'll also do a survey. We're gonna ask you questions about what you like about being here, what you dislike about being here, what you like about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because the point is to resource our staff, to resource our faculty, to resource our employees. And what better way to start than to just ask you and get your feedback? That's important. Ongoing evaluation of OTC policies, procedures, and practices. I get to sit on a PMP committee at this point. Um, they told me it was the funnest committee, and so far, it's been pretty good. Um, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed learning about the college. I've enjoyed learning about the policies that we have in place. And so I'm on there. <laughs> and I get to stay on there until they kick me out. Hopefully, they don't, don't kick me out. But um, we're going to continue to evaluate those policies with an equitable lens, with an equity lens, which, by the way, OTC already does a pretty decent job with trying to create equity. Um, and I'm really, really proud about that. That's awesome to be a part of. We're going to look at some state um, initiatives, some local initiatives in which we create best practices for all of the institutions in Missouri. What we know is that best practices always change, right? There's not really a regulatory body for diversity, equity, and inclusion. But we do know that when we do things together, this might sound a little like cliche-ish, cliche-ish, cliche, cliche. When we do things together, it typically works out pretty well. And so the Missouri High, uh, Department of Higher Education and Workforce Development has put together this initiative to uh, called the Missouri Equity Project, and the opportunities are going to be endless. I get to serve on one of the uh, advisory committees, and I'm just looking forward to being a part of that, and you can rest assured that OTC is going to have these seats at the table to ensure that we're following best practices and we're following um, in line with what our um, other institutions are doing that we partner with. 
It also looks like the Missouri College Access Network and some of the others that have trickled down from this equity project. And then inclusive excellence. Inclusive excellence is a framework that um, was started by Dr. Damon Williams and the AACNU. And um, many institutions use it. Our, our own um, backyard institution of Missouri State uses it. Um, at least the Springfield community is starting to implement it. And so it just kind of makes sense that we follow suit with inclusive excellence. Um, and as we continue to hash that out when the, as the months come, um, and you'll be informed, you'll be a part of that, um, the opportunity to resource our students, our employees, and our community with this inclusive excellence framework is the position that we're going to take. It's the direction that we're going to go in. Before I got here, um, I believe Oki put together a um, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee task force. Um, and what they told me is, you know, right when they were about to get started, they learned that this position was going to be hired. And so they kind of pumped the brakes, but what they did do was put together the skeleton of a website and they came up with this video. And so as the video says, dynamic compassion. I love that. That's going to be the theme of this office is dynamic compassion. What does that mean? It goes back to what we talked about earlier. Will we, be, will we have the bravery to be the light that's necessary? Will we be able to reach out our arms for others, for our coworkers, for our students, for our community, to ensure that when they step foot on this campus, they'll feel like they belong? I often hear we're a family, right? Maybe not just here, but I've heard that in elsewhere, in other places. Well, if we're a family, we really want to embrace every individual that we can. And we have to operate in dynamic compassion because there are going to be times where we don't want to operate with any type of compassion. And so the dynamic part, I love that. I'm very much appreciative for Oki and the rest of the team that put these things together. Um, the art students that were a part of this, it is phenomenal. And you can expect to see dynamic compassion pretty much everywhere uh, that this office goes. And so I want to end with this quote by James Baldwin. It says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And so I ask you, my coworkers, are you all ready to face the hard things with me? And as long as that's a yes, We'll have as much fun as we can make this process of embedding diversity, equity, and inclusion at Ozarks Technical Community College. I appreciate you. I cannot wait to continue to interact and learn from, learn with, learn alongside all of you. If there's anything that I can do, if there's anything that I've said that you have a question, comment, concern about, please feel free to email me, message me, whatever it is. Um, I'm here, I'm ready to serve, and I'm hopeful that we can continue the mission of providing an affordable, high quality education for all of the students that exist and a great work culture for our employees. We are going towards dynamic compassion and I'm looking forward to serving alongside you all.